Okay, so let's take a look at some practice questions on force, motion, and energy. Okay, so the diagram shows a speed time graph of a part of a short journey made by a cyclist. So you can see from P to Q, we're going at constant speed of 20 meters per second. And then at Q, it got a constant deceleration uh, up until 100 seconds. Okay, so which part of the diagram shows when the cyclist is traveling at constant speed? Well, as I just said, that's P to Q. We can see they're traveling at 20 meters per second the whole time. State what is happening during the rest of the journey. Uh, we can see it's constant deceleration there. And we need both parts. It's a straight line, so that's what tells us it's constant. And the speed is decreasing, that tells us what's deceleration. Calculate the distance traveled during the first 50 seconds. So distance is the area under a speed versus time graph. Uh, up to 50 seconds, that's easy. It's just a rectangle, so we just do 50 times 20. The distance traveled between 50 and 100, uh, that's a triangle, so we're going to use half times base times height to get its area, but we're still using the area under the graph, and we can see uh, that comes out as 500 meters. So to get the total distance, obviously we just need to add those two together, that comes out at 1500 meters. Calculate the average speed during the 100 seconds. So we know we've traveled 1500 meters, we know they've taken 100 seconds, so it must have been 15 meters per second. A small rubber ball falls vertically, hits the ground and rebounds vertically upwards. The, the diagram is a speed time graph for the ball. Okay, so we can see we've got constant acceleration from A to B. Uh, we've got then the sudden the speed drops to zero and then goes back up again so that's almost certainly hit the ground at that front so b c d is it hitting the ground and then bouncing back up and then d to e we can see is constant deceleration as it goes upwards again okay so using the information from the graph describe the following parts of the motion of the ball so a to b uh, as i said is constant acceleration as it free falls towards the ground and then from D to E, we've got constant deceleration. As the ball travels upwards from the ground, it's going to slow down until it comes to a stop. OK, so explain what's happening to the ball along the part of the graph from B through C to D. Um, so this is when the normal force from the ground causes the ball to decelerate. So you can see from the graph, the speed drops to zero. And then we can see it re-accelerates as the speed jumps back up again as it goes upwards. And that all happens, at, in, as we can see, in a very short period of time. OK, so whilst the ball is in contact with the ground, what is the overall change in speed? Uh, so the speed before is 9.5, the speed after is 8, so you get a difference of 1.5 meters per second. With change in velocity, the direction is going to become important. So because it's going in the opposite direction, the 8 is I'm going to give it sign minus 8. So if I'm saying downwards is positive, plus 9.5, upwards must be negative, minus 8, that gives us 17.5 meters per second. Okay, so use your answer to C to explain the difference between speed and velocity. So, velocity has magnitude and direction, speed only has magnitude. So that's why the velocity is minus 8, as, um, whereas in the speed equation it was 8. So we weren't giving any indication of direction, so um, that's kind of our difference there, velocity has direction. Use the graph to calculate the distance traveled by the ball between D and E. So to get distance, we need the area under the graph, as we've done before. The area is a triangle, so we're going to do half base times height. Use the graph to calculate the deceleration of the ball between D and E. So we need to find out what the gradient of our graph is, which is the acceleration. So the acceleration, well, it, it finishes at zero, starts at eight. So we can see the acceleration is minus 10 and therefore the deceleration is we would give it as plus 10 because we've already deceleration means the speed is decreasing okay so the diagram shows a cycle track the cyclist starts at a follows path a b c d e b so we're initially in a straight line and then going round a complete circle 
a cyclist starts at A and follows spot. So we've got this we've got a diagram showing the speed versus time. So going from A to B, we can see they're experiencing constant acceleration, and then from B onwards, you can see that the speed is constant. But the thing to note here is the direction is always changing because you're going around in a circle. So even though speed is constant, velocity is not because the direction is changing. So you use information from the two diagrams to describe the motion of the cyclists along AB. They have constant acceleration. It's a straight line speed versus time graph. And then BC, DEB, the cyclists are traveling at constant speed of six meters per second, but their direction is constantly changing. So velocity is changing. The velocity of the cyclist at C is shown. State one similarity, one difference between the velocity at C and the velocity at E. Well, they have the same magnitude, six meters per second, but they have completely opposite direction. Calculate the distance along the cycle track from A to B. Well, we're gonna find the area under the graph again. It's a triangle, so we're gonna use half base times height. To find the circumference of the circular part of the track, I'm gonna find the area under the graph from B to B, essentially how far they have to travel before they get back to B, and that's just going to be the circumference. So the diagram shows the path of one drop of water on the, in the jet from a powerful hose. So you can see it's been fired upwards, reached the maximum height, and then comes back down again. So we've got a graph of speed against time for the water drop shown in the diagram. Okay, so describe the movement of water drop in the first four seconds after leaving the hose. So we can see it's experiencing constant deceleration. As the speed is decreasing, but it's a straight line graph, hence constant deceleration. So use the diagram to find the speed of the water leaving the hose. Well, we can just read that off the graph. It's 40 meters per second. The time when the speed of the water is released, again, we're just reading that off the graph. It's four seconds. Use values from the diagram to calculate the acceleration as it falls back towards the ground. Well, we are finding the gradient, that would be the acceleration. Um, the final speed is 40, the initial speed is zero. We divide that by the time taken and we can end up with 10 meters per second squared. Okay, so calculate the greatest distance above the ground reached by the drop. So essentially we want to find the area up until four seconds. So we're gonna find the area under the graph um, until it reaches its maximum height at four seconds and that gives us 80 meters because the next area will be the distance is traveling back down to the ground again so we're not going to add that on a light vertical triangular piece of rigid plastic is pivoted at corner p a horizontal five newton force acts at q describe what if anything will happen to the piece of plastic well it's going to rotate clockwise about the pivot because that five Newton force is gonna have a moment about the pivot, so therefore it's gonna make the object rotate. And as it's the only force, the object is gonna rotate in the direction of that force for the moment. On another occasion, we've got two five Newton forces acting. Describe what, if anything, will happen to the piece of plastic. Uh, nothing, because the moments of the forces are gonna cancel each other out. The force at Q has a clockwise moment, the force R has an anti-clockwise moment. They're both exactly the same distance from P, so that's gonna give us an overall moment of zero. On the diagram, mark the force that the pivot exerts on a piece of plastic, show the direction of the force by means of an arrow, and write the magnitude of the force next to the arrow. So if it's gonna be stationary, it must be a force to the left to cancel out the forces to the right, and it must be 10 Newtons to cancel out the two five Newton forces to the right. The diagram shows a hinged rail in a fence. The rail has to be lifted vertically in order to let people through. Okay. On the diagram, draw an arrow to show the position and direction of the smallest force that we needed to raise the rail. So we're gonna put it here and it needs to be upwards. So the reason we put it here is that's the furthest you can be from the hinge, which means we can have the, we've got the biggest perpendicular distance so we can have the smallest force. So that should be where we put it. Okay, so what is the correct physics term for the turning effect of a force? That is a moment. 
Suggest one way the designer of the fence should have reduced the force needed to raise the rail. Uh, I think the simplest way would be to make the rail out of a lighter material, so therefore it's going to need a smaller force anyway. Um, there, we could have introduced some sort of simple machine, like a compound pulley, but I think this is the simple, simplest way of doing it. So the diagram represents a hydroelectric system for generating electricity. I'll answer the following questions using words from this list. So we've essentially got types of energy. What sort of energy possessed by the water in the reservoir is the main source of energy for the system? Uh, well, it's lifted up high, so we've stored gravitational potential energy. When water flows down the pipe, it is moving, so therefore it has kinetic energy. The water makes the turbines in the power station rotate. What sort of energy do the turbines possess because of their rotation? Kinetic energy, they're moving. What sort of energy does the power station generate? Electric potential energy. None of the energy transfer processes is perfect. In what form is most of the wasted energy released? Thermal energy, or heat or internal energy, whatever you want to call it. The diagram shows a rock fall down a mountainside. Okay. So rocks higher up the mountain were disturbed by something and they rolled down the mountain until they stop at the bottom. In the boxes below, write the name of the type of energy being described. Before they fall, the rocks have the energy because of their position. Well, they start with gravitational potential energy. As the rocks are falling, their energy is changing to these other types of energy. So they're moving. So we're getting kinetic energy, we're always producing heat, so that's an easy one, and they're also going to make a noise as they're colliding with the sides of the mountain, so we can make some sound energy as well. At the bottom, the only energy retained by the rocks is going to be thermal. All energy ends up as thermal energy eventually, it's just some other things in between. A, person sh a diagram shows a person pulling a loaded barrow along a path from A to B at a steady speed. State the two quantities you need to know in order to be able to calculate the work done. So work done is force times distance moved parallel to the force. So we need force and the distance moved in the direction of the force. Another person pulls an identical barrow and load from A to B, but this person pulls much harder or applies a bigger force, if you like, than person A. Describe what happens to the second person's barrow. So. It takes less time to reach B um, because it has a larger acceleration and therefore reaches a higher speed. Okay, so state which person has the greater power between A and B. Well, it's going to be the second person. And there are two things that are going to do this. One, they do more work. So if they travel the same distance, uh, double the force, they're going to do double the work. They're also going to do the work in a shorter period of time. As I said, the they're going to get the barrow to a higher speed, it'll take a shorter time to cross the distance, so higher power. Okay, so a man is delivering a cupboard to a house. The man rolls the cupboard at a steady speed from the lorry to the house. The friction force in the wheels is 40 newtons. State the force with which the man has to push. Well, 40 newtons. It says it's traveling at steady speed, so the resultant force must be zero. So they must both be 40 newtons, so they cancel out. The cupboard weighs 720 newtons, so we've been given the weight force. State the smallest force needed to lift the cupboard, well, 720 newtons, because then you'd be lifting it at constant speed. The step is 0.2 meters high. Calculate the work done to lift the cupboard. So change in GPE is mass times gravitational field strength times change in height. Mass times gravitational field strength is just the weight, which we've already been given, 720. So we do 720 times 0.2 gives us 144 joules. The man has to ask his assistant to help him lift the cupboard onto the step. Together they lift it onto the step in 1.2 seconds. The men work equally hard. Calculate the power developed by each man. So the total power would be the work done divided by 1.2 giving you 120 watts, which means each person has supplied or 60 watts of power.